Thanks for checking out today's video about teams that would kill our kids. One thing people wonder about kids who kill in groups, would they have reached this level of violence on their own? Watch the video and let us know what you think in the comments. Also, please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link to the channel in the description box below this video, and we'll have a link at the end of the video. Just before we start today's video, we want to talk about our fantastic sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is the best streaming service for documentaries, and I love scrolling through their new releases section. I saw that they added a documentary about a topic we've covered a couple times on the channel, and that's homicidal sleepwalking. Sleepwalkers Who Kill covers some of the most notorious cases of people who apparently killed while sleepwalking. The documentary also examines the science behind sleepwalking. So were these people really asleep when they committed these horrible murders? Or were they just using sleepwalking as an excuse to get away with their crimes? Check out Sleepwalkers Who Kill for yourself and let me know what you think in the comments section. Also, please check out some documentaries and other genres on Magellan TV. They have great series and features in history, science, biography, and so much more. If you have a 4K TV, you're going to love Magellan TV because they have a bunch of great documentaries that are available in 4K. And you should get Magellan TV today because they're offering criminally listed viewers a month of free service. To get this amazing offer, go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll be supporting criminally listed and you'll find something great to watch. Number three, John Duncan, Emmanuel Sanchez. Wenatchee is a small city in Washington state. In the mid-1990s, it was home to about 25,000 people. In the summer of 1994, it was home to John Duncan and Manuel Sanchez, who were both 12 years old. Both boys had behavioral problems. Sanchez's problems started about four years earlier, after his mother had brain surgery to remove a tumor. The surgery left her partially paralyzed. His mother said it changed him the first time he saw her face drooping. After that, he started acting out. Between the ages of 10 and 12, Sanchez was in and out of foster homes. In spring 1994, he was transferred to a new school. But then he was expelled because he brought a pellet gun to school and threatened a teacher and several students. In August 1994, Sanchez was living with his mother. But around August 10th, he ran away. On August 19th, Manuel Sanchez and John Duncan tried to break into a neighbor's home. They cut the phone line, removed the motion sensing lights, and broke a basement window. But they were stopped before they got into the house. The two 12 year olds ran away from the scene. They went to a friend's home the next day and stole three handguns. Then they went to the banks of the Columbia River and started firing the guns into the river. Camping near the river was 50 year old seasonal worker Emilio Pernetta. Pernetta screamed at the boys to stop shooting so they started firing their guns at him. Pernetta responded by throwing rocks at the two boys. Sanchez was hit in the chin and it caused him to bleed. They continued to shoot at Pernetta until he fell to the ground. Then the two boys ran up the embankment where they had more ammunition stored. Sanchez said, I'm not leaving until this guy is dead. Duncan said he'd take care of it. Duncan took two guns and he went down to the riverbank. He saw Pernetta lying on the riverbank and he was bleeding from two wounds. He wasn't moving and Duncan thought he was dead. Duncan later said, I shot Manuel's gun until it was empty. My first shot hit him in the eye and it was sick, so I closed my eyes and shot him more. The sounds of the gunshots caught the attention of someone who called the police. When John Duncan walked back up the embankment, the police were waiting for him. Both he and Manuel Sanchez were arrested. 50-year-old Emilio Pernetta was found dead in the water. The medical examiner determined they had been shot at least 18 times. 
The police asked Duncan why he returned to the riverbank and continued to shoot him. He said, I wanted to shoot him. I was mad at him for hitting my best and only friend with a rock. The two boys were tried separately in January 1995 in juvenile court. They were both found guilty of first degree murder. They were sentenced to a juvenile detention center until the age of 21. This means they would have been released in 2004. What happened to them after they were released is unknown. John Duncan and Emmanuel Sanchez would both be about 40 years old at the time of this video. Number 2. Demarquis Salkins and Dominic Lang In March 2013, Sherry West was living in Brunswick, Georgia with her 13-month-old son, Antonio Santiago. Antonio was born on February 7, 2012. Sherry considered him her miracle baby. Four years earlier, in New Jersey, her 18-year-old son was in a fight. He pulled out a knife, but was wrestled away from him. My son ended up being stabbed to death. The man who killed him wasn't charged because it was determined that he was acting in self-defense. Wes had been permanently injured in a car accident a few years earlier. She also suffered from mental illness and she was on medication. On the morning of March 21, 2013, Wes took Antonio for a walk to the post office. She was pushing him in his stroller. As she was walking back home, she was confronted by two teen boys. One was armed with a handgun. The two teen boys demanded her money, and she said she didn't have any. The boy with the gun aimed it at Antonio, and he said he would shoot unless she handed over her purse. He then started counting down for five. When he got to two, Wes stopped him. The teen boy tried to wrestle the purse away from her, but he couldn't. So he started counting down for five again. When he finished counting, he fired a warning shot at the ground. Then he shot Wes to the right thigh. Then he aimed the gun at Antonio in the stroller. About six inches away from his face, he pulled the trigger. The bullet went right between his eyes and he died nearly instantly. Antonio Santiago was just six weeks past his first birthday. After firing off the deadly shot, the two teen boys ran off. Sherry West was taken to the hospital and she was treated for her wound. She survived her wound. The next morning, West looked at several photo lineups. She identified the shooter. He was 17-year-old Demarquis Salkins. The police then identified his accomplice, 15-year-old Dominic Lang. They were arrested the day after the murder. They were both charged with first-degree murder. A few days after they were arrested, the police went to Elkins' mother's home. Elkins' mother and aunt tried providing Elkins with an alibi for the time of the murder. But the police determined they were lying, so they were arrested. They eventually gave statements that led the police to search a saltwater pond. In the pond, they found a 22 caliber handgun. Testing proved it was the murder weapon. After Elkins and Lang were arrested, the pastor of a church, Reverend Wilfredo Calix Flores, contacted the police. Eleven days before Antonio was murdered, he was outside of his church. Three teen boys came up and one was armed with a gun. They told him to hand over his wallet and his phone. Calix Flores refused and one of the young men shot him in the left arm. The bullet went through his arm and grazed his chest. After shooting him, the three teen boys ran off. Calix Flores called 911 and then he went to the steps of the church where he prayed. He survived his injury. 
He said that Demarquis Salkins was the person who shot him. Hawkins went to trial for the murder of Antonio Santiago in August 2013. Dominic Lang made a plea deal and he testified against Hawkins. The trial lasted for two weeks. Then the jury deliberated for two hours. Hawkins was found guilty of murder. Since he was under 18 at the time of the murder, he was not eligible for the death penalty. Instead, he was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. In April 2015, Dominic Lang pleaded guilty to armed robbery. He was sentenced to two years of prison and eight years of probation. When he pleaded guilty, he had already served two years, so he was released based on time served. At the time of this video, the Marquis Salkins is 27 years old. He is serving a sentence at the Macon State Prison. Number 1. Omir Nidham, Richard Capo, Jeffrey P., Amanda G., and Christian G. In the autumn of 1998, 13-year-old Zong Vang was living with his family in Green Bay, Wisconsin. On the evening of September 23, 1998, Zong's older brother made dinner, but he needed some tomatoes. The sun was still up, so Zong's brother asked him to ride his bike to a nearby grocery store. Zong got on his bike, rode to the store, and bought the tomatoes. But, for some reason, on his way home, he stopped at the parking garage at St. Vincent Hospital. A man was driving out of the parking garage when he heard what sounded like a wet bag of cement hitting the concrete. He saw the body of a young boy lying in the driveway. It was 13-year-old Song Bang. The man got out of his car and told the parking attendant to call 911. By the time the man got to Zong, an off-duty nurse was attempting to help him. The man gave the nurse his shirt to help stem the bleeding from the back of Zong's head. Before Zong was moved into the hospital, a police officer drew a chalk outline around his body. He was then moved into the hospital. But tragically, 13-year-old Zong Bang died from head injuries. The police determined that, based on where his body was found, he hadn't accidentally fallen. His body landed too far away from the building. His family also was adamant that he was not suicidal. So the police believed that he was thrown from the top of the five-story parking garage. But why would someone want to kill the 13-year-old boy? No arrests were made in the case in the days or weeks after the murder. Then, months later, in the spring of 1999, 14-year-old Richard Capro was arrested for car theft and burglary. In custody, he started to make some incriminating comments about the death of Song Bang. After some questioning, Kerpo told the police what happened that fateful day in September. Kerpo said he was angry with his mother and he wanted to fight someone or see a fight. He was hanging out with his friends, 14-year-old Omir Ninham, 13-year-old Jeffrey P., 14-year-old Amanda G., and 14-year-old Christian J. The last names of the three youths were not made public. They were hanging outside the parking garage when they saw Zong ride up on his bike. He was a complete stranger to them. Kerpo said let's mess with him and Ninham told him he had his back. Kerpo and Ninham taunted Zong while the other three encouraged them. Kerpo pulled Zong's bike away from him. Zong demanded it back and then Ninham punched him in the face. The punch knocked Zong to the ground. Song got to his feet and then ran into the parking garage. The three teenage boys and two girls chased him. They caught him on the fifth floor. Song begged to be left alone. He wanted to know why they wanted to hurt him. Kerpo and Ninham started pushing him and then Ninham punched him in the chest. Ninham grabbed Song by the wrist and pinned him against the wall. While he couldn't defend himself, Kerpo punched him in the face. 
Thinker Po grabs Zong by the ankles. With Nanham holding Zong by his wrist, Thinker Po holding him by his ankles, they started swinging Zong over the parking garage wall. Zong was obviously terrified and begged for them to stop. One of the three kids watching encouraged them to drop him over the wall. Another one of them said, wouldn't be funny if he fell. As they were swinging him, Kerpo said to drop him. Kerpo said that Zong just sailed over the wall. He plummeted 45 feet to his death. Zong screamed all the way down. On June 11, 1999, about nine months after the murder, Kerpo and Ninham were arrested for the murder. They were both charged as adults, even though they were just 13 and 14 when the murder was committed. The other three teenagers were not arrested. Richard Kerpo went to trial first in November 1999. The trial lasted a week and the jury deliberated for less than three hours. He was found guilty of first degree intentional homicide and physical abuse of a child. In January 2000, he was sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole after 50 years. Amir Nidham went to trial in March 2000. Like her post trial, it lasted a week and the jury deliberated for less than three hours. He was also found guilty. On January 29th, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. In January 2016, the United States Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life sentences without parole for people who committed crimes under the age of 18 were unconstitutional. Ninam's lawyers appealed to get him a new sentencing hearing. In October 2016, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled that he would not get a new trial. They said it was because his life without parole sentence was discretionary and not mandatory. So, unless something changes, Omar Ninham will die in prison. He is currently 38 years old. Richard Capro is 37 years old and he could be paroled in 2050 when he will be 65 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. You can find a link to the channel on the screen now and in the description box below this video. Well that's all for today, thanks again for watching.